Hi, everybody. What's up? Welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. George Takei is here with us. The legend is on the show. What's up, George? How are you? I'm doing great, and I'm here to talk about uh, the Serial Box uh, uh, short stories uh, written by an enormously gifted uh, sci-fi writer, Ken Liu, uh, which I recorded, had the privilege of recording. It was a real joy because he's such a wonderful writer in, and an imaginative sci-fi writer. And I got to read two of his books, one called Saboteur and the other called Summer Reading. And they're both a wonderful complement to each other. It's, uh, it deals with uh, humans and technology. The Saboteur uh, short story uh, is man against technology. Technology becomes a threat, a truck driver who has to deal with driverless vehicles and driverless trucks, which means his job. And so he's trying to protect his job in every and any way he can. And uh, so it's man versus technology. And he wins and he loses at the same time. It's a fascinating read. And it's the perfect complement to the second book, Summer Readings, where technology, robots, machines have absorbed in over the centuries a lot of the qualities that make us human. Empathy, compassion, appreciation of art, ideas, and, and, and our heritage of the, uh, that we, uh, we gained from the past, and the sharing of that. And humans, by that time, are no, no longer resident on the planet Earth, but they come to visit as, as tourists this planet. And they have lost those qualities that the uh, curators, mechanical, technological curators of this planet, keeping the past history of humankind going. And we see how the, that real humans, having colonized the other planets and coming back as tourists, have become dehumanized. They've lost that quality that makes this robot technology uh, very humane. Fascinating. That's re it's really fascinating on a number of different levels. And actually, a couple of months ago, I talked to Ken, and he's just a really interesting guy, and he's had an amazing career. So what's it like for you just to see the evolution of sci-fi, you know, over the past few decades? Well, I envy you having talked to him. I've not, I've not met him. You got to make this happen. Photo. Come on now, George. <laughs> I've got to. I Google him, and uh, he looks like an interesting guy and a creative guy. And I would love to talk to the, the man who, uh, who told these stories. Uh, so you have a leg up on me. What's he like? <laughs> He, he's a really interesting guy. He's, he's mild-mannered. He's, he's really chill. But as you know from his books, he's, he's thinking about things that are, are way outside of reality for most people, especially with artificial intelligence, too. I feel like that's kind of the future of things. And he really has his finger on the pulse with all that. He's chill, you say? He's very chill. He's very even keel, mild-mannered. But yet his mind can romp into these really crazy places that he writes about. Oh, I'm disappointed because... I, I, I've, I get from him passion. Uh, I think uh, he's just low key about it. He, he didn't want to be boastful about it. The passion is there, but the way that he communicates it is just, he's just very even keel about it. He didn't want to yeah, but, hype himself he, up too much. He wants the words to do the work. Yeah, I, well, that's the robot part. <laughs> You know, exactly. uh, in summer, have you read Summer Reading? I have not. No, I definitely oh, need to. Well, you got to uh, pay a dollar ninety nine to hear me read that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the robot is a fascinating. I mean, the robot curator of uh, this library now gone to seed 
and overgrown with vines and weeds and 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 uh, animals and insects. Uh, but this is the museum, the, the repository of the literary works of humankind of centuries past. Mm -hmm. And a robot is the curator of this place. And this robot has absorbed in so much of the uh, human characteristics. I mean, enjoying literature, uh, ch cherishing the heritage, the past, and what makes that machine so engaging is so, uh, it, it, he, he, he loves his, and then he also is mindful of uh, the need to protect that. And here's this child that, uh, you know, is a child and could be destructive of, uh, you know, if, if the child's uh, handling that. And yet he has that quality of wanting to share. And when there's evidence of her showing a glimmer of that appreciation, he makes a great sacrifice. I mean, it's, and so I visualize Ken Liu as someone who has that just palpably, I mean, it's out, externalized. Maybe he's, I think if he's, you two were in the same room, it, it would come out a little bit more. He was just hanging out, talking about his books with me. I think once he was in the presence of somebody like you, that, that stuff's just <laughs> shooting right out of him. You have that Somebody like me. <laughs> How do you perceive me? I mean, you are full of energy. You're full of wisdom. You're somebody who's <laughs> lived this incredible life. And you like to make people laugh, too. That, that, that's what I'm getting here from the first few minutes of talking Well, to that is me. And I sort of... So, well, I've got to meet him, and, and I'm sure we'll, I can stimulate him. You know, yes, it's like- I uh, have no doubt about that. <laughs> it's like the, uh, the female fans of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. uh, they loved Spock, who was totally without emotion. Mm -hmm. He was keenly intelligent. He was uh, commanding with his in intelligence, but had no sense of humor because he, you know, he didn't have that quality. He was uh, a, a hybrid of human and Vulcans. And th these female fans thought they're the ones who can bring out some of that human quality in Spock. And, and I guess I have that feeling about Ken Liu that I can get him <laughs> to be <laughs> more externalized, <laughs> not so cool and... Uh, dispassionately well it's amazing how humankind. art can have that impact on people whether it's writing whether it's tv show a movie you mentioned star trek and for me listen man i'm 27 like you were doing your thing well before i was even on this earth so give me the picture like how does star trek blow up into this major deal and, and how did that change your life ultimately star trek is uh, twice as old as you are yeah <laughs> absolutely S star trek is 54 years old now, and you're 27. I'm 27, yeah. It's got a few years on me at this point. <laughs> well, you know, you are the, the future of Star Trek. I mean, you're, you're that generation. Um, what did the, the, what's the impact of Star Trek on me? When I was cast, previously, I'd been uh, working, I was a working uh, actor. Um, did I tell you, I've been doing interviews, so I forget what I shared. My first gig was uh, dubbing in English dialogue to a Japanese sci-fi film. Wow. And that's all the way back in the 50s, right? That was back in the 50s, yeah. Wow. Uh, oh, I guess I told that to the uh, previous uh, journalist. But my first uh, paying gig was uh, dubbing in English dialogue to a fantastical a Japanese science fiction film, uh, this, this creature, this prehistoric creature that was uh, uh, sealed hermetically in uh, a cave. Wow. But radiation is what brings him to life and terrorizes Japan. Japan was terrorized by, you know, radiation, obviously. Uh, this was you know, post-war uh, Japan and, and anything having to do with radiation was a monster, horrific. 
and destructive. And uh, uh, it, uh, it was a cheapo sci-fi film, but because it was a kind of action sci-fi, uh, uh, these uh, producers of uh, uh, cheap films uh, imported it and wanted to dub in English dialogue so that uh, it can be marketed to the American audience. And they were hiring what they called Japanese voices. Now, I'd, I'd like to think I'm Japanese and I have a voice, but I don't <laughs> think my voice would, could be uh, uh, racially categorized, but right. they thought <laughs> it, uh, I was a Japanese voice. And so my, I was an architecture student at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And you know, this was summer vacation. I was back home in Los Angeles and my father, it was my father that actually saw the ad in the paper and he said, you don't have a summer job and you're a ham. Uh, why don't you go and look into this uh, uh, gig that they're advertising for? And I auditioned and I got that job. And so my very first job was working with my voice. And here, the most recent job is so working with the my same voice. Thing. There's that circle. <laughs> Maybe that's an indica uh, indicator of wh where my career has gone. It started that way and I'm back where I, be where I began, except that was uh, a lot of yelling and screaming and, and uh, uh, oh my God, hor hor horrible, scary, ah! you know, that sort of right. <laughs> acting. Uh, so I'd like to think that uh, reading sci-fi film uh, 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 stories, short stories, is uh, a leg up on that, <laughs> those uh, horror films. Well, um, I, think, I think it's cool that you've touched on all these different chapters of science fiction. So you mentioned that first part. Then you had, you know, the time on the Twilight Zone that you got to do and Star Trek now. And obviously you're here. I mean, you've had so many amazing experiences. And like even the original Twilight Zone, like I, I can't even imagine like people sitting in their living room watching that like even the one in 2020 hits you on a different level but like what was it like when the twilight zone was first out and you got an opportunity to do that well that was be, uh, even before star trek right uh star trek is, was 1955 and uh twilight zone was uh um no 65 uh, 1965 and twilight zone was i think 1962 or three thereabouts um I was a fan of uh, Twilight Zone already, and I, I thought particularly Rod Serling, who was the host uh, uh, of the show, had a fantastic voice, great, rich, uh, deep, uh, basso profundo uh, voice, and, uh, and, and his uh, writing was wonderful. In fact, I discovered Rod Serling even before he did Twilight Zone. There was, back in uh, the 50s, a, an amazing television uh, series uh, called Playhouse 90. Have you heard or read about it? I have not, no. Give me the lowdown here. It was a 90-minute live uh, drama, original drama, written by some of the brightest up-and-coming uh, young writers of the time. People like Patty Chayefsky, Reginald Rose, oh. Rod Serling. And uh, I think it was Rod Serling that wrote uh, Requiem for, uh, uh, for a Heavyweight, Requiem for a Heavyweight, which was a, a powerful piece of television uh, drama. And they cast some of the uh, bright up and coming young uh, uh, actors of the time, Geraldine Page, uh, uh, but not Charlton Heston, but someone that looks like him. Uh, what, I can't remember his name now, but some, um, leading actors, young actors of that period, 90 minute drama, original, wow. written by bright young writers and live. So it was the, the worst of the, both the theater and films uh, combined together. Live uh, uh, teleplay of, of, uh, on for 90 minutes. So if you made a mistake, or there was a bobble, or you opened a uh, door and there was a grip uh, sneaking away. I mean, that was seen wow. by a million people throughout the land, uh, but it also had the immediacy of theater. They were seeing it as it was happening. 
with the mistakes and all. That's it incredible. Was incredible, uh, risky uh, 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 the theater presentation or television presentation. And so I was a Rod Sterling fan from the Playhouse 90 days. And when I got cast in that, as a matter of fact, I did a Playhouse 90. Um, what was it called? A Made in Japan. I played a, a bitter uh, Japanese soldier back in Japan uh, uh, after the Second World War. So I, I'm a defeated soldier and embittered because an, a marriage was uh, arranged for me with uh, the daughter of a um, wealthy family. But the occupation po uh, force was already there in Japan. And Dean Stockwell uh, uh, was a, uh, an American soldier and he and my betrothed fall in love. But they have a lover's quarrel on a bridge and accidentally he pushes her over the bridge wow. and she's killed. And I am the obvious suspect. I'm embittered. I, I, I hate the American occupying force. And they, uh, one of them killed my betrothed. Although wow. she, there was no love relationship there. And I'm, be, I'm being tried. I mean, it was a wonderful uh, drama. But uh, the assistant director on that was uh, the director of this script for Twilight Zone, not written by, uh, yeah. by uh, Rod Serling, alas. And so I was uh, brought in without uh, an audition. I was wow. precast because he, he saw my work from, uh, uh, and the way I worked from uh, uh, Playhouse 90. And so I had that wonderful role in uh, Twilight Zone. And as a matter of fact, these are all inter, uh, interlinked. The um, casting director for uh, 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 Twilight Zone <clears throat> was uh, with uh, Warner Brothers and he uh, called me in for, no, not, not with Warner Brothers, with the uh, uh, Paramount Studios, pa uh, uh, Desilu Studios. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that called me in for an interview uh, with uh, Gene Roddenberry the writer producer of uh, Star Trek. So it, these were all interlinked. Uh, uh, amazing. What was his name? Uh, uh, Hoyt Bowers was the casting director. And uh, that's how I got the interview. And I met Gene Roddenberry. He described to me the show and the character. And I mean, I, I'd been a working actor, but they were not this kind of a, well, first of all, it was a pilot film for a series. A series, what that means is steady employment. Right. That's, a, that's the, a nice thing in this uh, transient world as an actor, right? That was for a starving young actor, you know. <laughs> uh, Playhouse 90 was very prestigious, but that was a one shot. After that's that, a, I'm unemployed. Amazing. Twilight Zone was a wonderful uh, chunk of wor uh, work to sink my teeth into, but after it was over, I'm back again on the unemployment line at the uh, Hollywood unemployment <laughs> office. <laughs> hey, how are you, Joe? You're, you're back here again, are you? you but I'm, I'm getting another uh, uh, audition. <laughs> you know, that was the clubhouse uh, there. George, and, uh, I, got, I got one more question for you. Oh, you yes. have done all these amazing things in your career. You have been an advocate for the LGBTQ community. You've spoken out about being in an internment camp when you were a kid, when, when people think about your legacy, what are one or two sentences you want them to say about who George Takei has been? I cared. I cared about our democracy because I was very young when I was incarcerated, five years old to eight years old, but when I became a teenager, I became very curious about our incarceration and I became a, a, a voracious reader and I searched for information about my incarceration, nothing in the, in the books of that time. Even civics books didn't mention uh, the, the imprisonment of innocent American citizens of Japanese ancestry for no reason except that we looked like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. 
And so I was very curious about that. And the only source I, I could go to was my father. And so we had many after dinner conversations and he was the one that uh, guided me and also got me act, uh, to be an activist. He said, be, be active in student government. I became student body president. And then uh, one, oh, I, I kept challenging my fa father. Why did you go? Why didn't you protest? Look at the civil rights uh, uh, people, uh, the African-Americans. They're out there protesting. And you took us, I, I, I feel very guilty about that you know, my challenges now, but he said, let me show you how it's got to work. And he took me downtown to the Adlai Stevenson for President campaign headquarters. And there working together with other people passionately dedicated to get, getting Adlai Stevenson uh, elected president, I discovered what a participatory democracy is. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's how I got to be an activist. And I realize now, particularly now, when we are in this in this swirling cataclysm right now, you know the uh, the racial injustice uh, that's what we call it now Black Lives Matter uh, campaign. The uh, just like in the Great Depression of the 30s, now we have people lined up for food to subsist. I mean, but they're not lined up uh, in line uh, physically. They're these, there are these lines of cars now. People who have cars are hungry. And, you know, Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, in Pearl Harbor's bombing, just about 2,000 people died. 9-11, 3,000 people died. Today, now 200,000 people from 202,000. <laughs> 202,000 people dead. And we have this dysfunctional leader and, and, and so we are living through a cataclysm. Well, that's and, why we need people like you. We need science fiction. I think that's the perfect place to leave it. George, really nice to meet you, man. Stay healthy. Thanks so much and best of luck, all right? Live long and prosper.